Hi, Roden Schwartz have seen my recent videos on 12-bit oscilloscopes and they went, and I'm paraphrasing, that's not a 12-bit oscilloscope, this is a 12-bit oscilloscope. So they decided that the EEV Log Lab must have one of these bad boys and it's their new MXO 4 series fell straight off the back of a truck. It's so brand spanking new. I think it might be the only one in the country at the moment or one of a couple. Anyway, thank you very much, Roden Schwartz. So let's check this thing out and check out what a real 12-bit oscilloscope is. And we're talking about, yeah, I, if you have to ask the price, you probably can't afford it. It starts from about, a, I think it's about 8K US or something like that. Well, it doesn't just end at 12 bits. I think it goes up to 18 bits, apparently, with uh, two different, uh, like, high-res type modes in it. There's got, like, a hardware mode and your traditional e-res um, type mode as well. But anyway, let's check it out. There's actually three boxes here, so we'll see what's in them. So let's start off with a little jobby here. References China Roz. Um, I, uh, this doesn't come from China. This is This comes from... Germany, so hi to all my German viewers. Ah, turns out the probes are made in China. Pretty sure the scope is, uh, well, it's actually not made in Germany. It's made in the old um, Haymeg factory in the Czech Republic, I believe. There's their new uh, logic probe. Uses like the, this giant looking HDMI connector here, but apparently uh, this is not compatible with the earlier ones. I, I don't know what scopes use this one, but it, I think this is their newer interface. Um, not used on earl some earlier Roden Schwartz scopes anyway. Make I ideas real. I wonder who came up with that slogan. Did they pay some, uh, you know, artsy fartsy company to come up with it? Well, that was a waste of a box. Is this optional? I guess it is. It's the front cover. Ta-da! Now, you're either a fanboy of front covers. Leave it in the comments down below. Are you a fanboy of front covers? Are you one of those who, before you go to sleep at night, oh, you disconnect all the probes gently and you rub them and then you uh, put the front cover on to protect your scope. You a nice r &S branding on here. And um, Or, um, if you're like me, uh, do you use them as, like, convenient, like, trays to, like, clean crap in and stuff like that? Um, i, I got a Keysight one. I use it for everything. Like, it's just a... No, it's a great tray to just like, you know, do liquids and other crap in, just clean stuff. As it turns out, the scope itself doesn't actually weigh much. Um, it's a gigantic box, but it's going to be all protection. Bloody scopes don't weigh much anymore. I don't know. When I was a boy. Ah. See, China again. I'm pretty sure this is not, maybe some of it is made in China. I did all the, all the packaging bits are made in China, probably. Well, <laughs> that's big. But like I said, the scope actually does come from the, I believe, the uh, Czech, the Heime, old Haymeg factory. Apparently they are phasing out the um, Haymeg brand. So sorry to all you Haymeg uh, fanboys. I am one of them. But uh, there we go. We've got a nice probe pouch. Oh, look at that. That's schmick. Look at that. Wow, 700 meg passive probes. That's about, even though I believe this is a one, well, this scope actually goes to 1.5 gig bandwidth. But uh, yeah, passive probes do not go that high. I mean, you're really pushing it at 700. You're kind of pushing it at 500 meg. At 700 meg, eh, you know, like it, you're barely going to do that. I think tech do a one gig passive probe, but... Jeez, if you're, if you're probing stuff at one gig using a passive probe, I think you probably have to question what you're doing. Those Germans, they take safety seriously. Look at the multilingual safety instructions. Someone in the OH&S department had a wet dream compiling that, let me tell you. And it's official, the getting started guide is not as thick as the safety instructions, although that's all in English, so yeah, it's not multilingual, but there you go. Yeah. Online manual, like you don't need a like a full printed manual these days. Uh, I wouldn't bother. And as I said, this is all protection. So look at this. Oh wow, yeah. I mean, you know, with a serious bit of kit like this, you definitely want to make sure it's protected properly. But there are companies, courier companies, who would screw that up anyway. So yeah. Oh, this is rather satisfying. And look at this. This is good attention to detail. They've got the foam on the front like that, actually protecting the front. Wow, well, when you're spending this bit of coin on your scope, then, yeah, you want it to come in one piece. Ah, jeez, how much static did that generate? Well, I think we've given it its first static test. Beautiful. Oh, look at this thing. Look at the size of that screen. 
Wow, it's one of these newfangled touch jobbies too. And yeah, oh, I won't, I won't peel. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, ready? Here we go. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh! Look at that. Look at that. And the first thing I noticed that is a matte finish, and that's very different to the RTB 2000 that you can see here. And you can see if I tilt that. Hi. Right. You can see my lights. And it's just like a tiny little annoying thing that that is uh, reflective, but this one isn't. It's very matte finish and uh, sure, if I tilt it up enough, like you're going to see the lights, you're going to see the diffused lights, and technically you can still see me, but the, like it's like an anti-glare matte kind of finished screen, so that's really nice. I like the blue. I don't know, what, what Pantone colour blue was that? Very nice. Anyway, look at that. Germany. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Look at the size of this fan. Are you kidding me? If you haven't got a sense of scale, okay, that's my hand. And check it out. Visa mount. And I think this might be the first time that I've actually um, seen the stuff on the top like this. We've got trigger out, reference in uh, 10 meg, and uh, external reference, of course, when you've got a scope of this uh, magnitude. <laughs> I'm here all week. Get it? 12-bit magnitude. Anyway, 18-bit uh, performance in various uh, modes. Yeah, this is designed for serious signal analysis, right? This is a serious <laughs> measurement bit of kit, so you want your external uh, m uh, reference um, input. Um, external uh, LAN, external HDMI, USB uh, device, and two uh, USB. They're threes, actually. Hey, they're USB 3s. They, they got the blue. No, it's not made in the Czech Republic. It's made in Romania. Wow, I don't want Romanian viewers. Oh, I've got to say that these probes are pornographic. These are probably the best oscilloscope probes I've ever seen. And made in Germany. Thank you very much. Look at this. Made in Germany, even stamped on the cable. 700 meg passive probes. Doesn't get much better. And they're just... Oh, this is not feel a vision, but these just feel absolutely gorgeous. You even get a spare tip for it. They're really ultra tiny and just wow. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> so that's the RTZP11 for those playing along at home. 700 meg, uh, 9.5 puff. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Okay, where's the feet on this? Ooh, ooh, okay. Angular thing like this. And they... Oh, they pop out all right. I don't mind that. You are starting to see the glare. That's my studio light over here. Yep, sorry about that. Will it tip over? No. No, I can press it like I'm pressing hard. I really, no. You could tip it over, but no, to press these, no, it's not. It's not going anywhere. Nice. Anyway, check out this seriously sexy bit of kit. Of course, in this uh, performance and uh, price bracket, we're talking about uh, active uh, probe interfaces. And we've got those two big HDMI-like monster HDMI inputs. Got three USBs on the front. Very handy. Two signal gen options. I've heard there are some additional signal gen functions. One of the things I like about the RTB2000 scope is some of its internal signal and pattern generator uh, capabilities. They call the input C instead of CH. I, I don't know, it kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. But anyway, external trigger in on the front. Very nice. And there's only two pattern gen uh, outputs here, like demo signal pattern gens. Uh, the RTB2000 has four so that's interesting. Anyway, the claims on this new uh, MX04 series are absolutely incredible. 4.5 million waveform updates per second. Um, the best out there, I believe, is the uh, Keysight at 1 million waveform updates per second, at least in this uh, class anyway. So 4.5 million, so it's going to be interesting to uh, do that comparison with the uh, Keysight uh, 3000. 400 uh, meg sample memory, 5 gig samples per second, 1.5 gig um, analog bandwidth in here, software... Uh, uh, software upgradable from uh, I can, can't don't know what their lowest end one is a couple hundred megs or something and 12-bit uh, ADC but it's got as I said it's got either 16 or up to 18-bit uh, HD mode which is different an additional mode to e-res mode so this is done in uh, presumably the ASIC or FPGA um, hardware in this thing they claim that it's got uh, the industry's best digital trigger sensitivity at one thousandth of a division Geez, I don't even know. That might be tricky to measure, but anyway, um, if we could, I don't know, but it's impressive. 
Less than one picosecond of jitter for all you anti-jitter uh, fanboys. Apparently got dual path uh, protocol analysis. So it's, I don't know, the industry's first thing. And it's got a 13.3 inch full HD uh, capacitive touch sense screen. So none of that, you know, 1280 by 800 uh, rubbish, full HD apparently. So this is an insane bit of kit and it's just been released. So let's pair it up and check it out. Um, it could take a while, like a uh, scope of this class. This is not uh, Windows, apparently. Um, so it is different to the, um, what is it, the uh, E series? I forget it. Oh, look, it's even got a thing. But apparently it is, this is not a Windows-based um, scope. So 1.1.2, oh, lots of relays clicking. It's going to have lots of relays in there. Lots of self-booting stuff. We're up to 38 seconds. Yeah, I expect it to take a while. Like, you know, this is a serious bit of kit. I mean, this just blows away. Oh, hey, there we go. 47, 48 seconds there. This just blows away any scope that I got here in the labs. Right, so it's a very docky interface. I, By default, it didn't... Oh, there we go. Yeah, it didn't come on. Um, so I guess it's just a... Oh, no, single, single click to turn on... Yeah, and then it moves them over here so we can turn on all four chat all four channels. There you go. Can we open up the vertical? There you go. Open up the horizontal up there, can we? Yep, there's the horizontal. And we can open up the acquisition. This is a bit different to the um, RTB uh, 2000, but you know, there's similar sorts of things up here like annotate, you know, so we can actually draw uh, color selection. Can we just can we just draw like that? Oh. Oh, yep, yeah, there we go. And I presumably I'd be able to hook up a moose as well. So just check that. Automatically recognize. Yes, it does. Look at that. And we'll draw in a little nose there. So they claim on their brochure front page that this thing uh, has an intuitive user interface you can get up and running in 15 minutes. So um, <laughs> yeah, this is just me dicking around with it now. It wasn't obvious how to shut down this annotation menu. I couldn't like double click. On that, I've got a, there's a little X over here, which I have to shut down like that. But anyway, there, there's your acquisition. Okay, so we're currently 2.5 gig samples per second. This is supposed to have five, but we've got all four channels on. So can we, yep, it's a little X next to it there. All right. And no, we haven't jumped up to five. So turn off channel one and sure enough, yet we jumped to five gig samples per second. So that's a, that's a bit disappointing in this class. It does actually halve to 2.5 gig. Um, when you turn on the uh, second channel, of course, if you turn on the third channel, you won't get that. Nah, it stays at five gigs. So if you do want to use your uh, two channels, you'd use channels one and uh, channel three. But that's uh, that's the same with, you know, eh, most scopes these days. I just uh, was hoping that uh, wouldn't be the case, but eh. So down here, we've got logic. You can turn that on. Math, what do we get? Anyway, it's got five math modes there. That's pretty comprehensive and you can do well, why didn't that? Because I'm in, I've got a mouse hooked up, I think. So you can get different, oh, just high pass, low pass filter, that's it. It's no band pass, you can go in Gaussian or rectangular, and you can set the cutoff. Anyway, we can go into a spectrum analyzer. This is supposed to have beautiful spectrum analyzer capabilities. Anyway, bus mode. Once again, uh, yeah, you've got to hit it twice. I squared C, SPI, UART, is that all? Would have expected a bit more, maybe, you know, I2S or something like that, perhaps. We've got apps. Uh, frequency response analysis, there you go. So that'd be our bode plot. Can we, oh, I heard, I heard relays click. Whoa, whoa, there we go. Yep, where, yep, <laughs> there you go. That's going to give us our bode plot. Anyway, the menu seems to be, uh, it's there all the time. So you can just call that up, but we are in the FRA mode. How do we get, a, see, how do we get out of FRA mode? It's not obvious. And you drag to rearrange tools. There you go. So you can set your um your you know your app bar up the top to have all sorts of stuff. So if you're into you know your recalls and stuff like that, you can put those up. You can have auto set up there as well if you want. There it is. It's obvious. Exit FRA right there. <laughs> Jeez, that's a big ass screen. We've got uh, ten divisions uh, vertically by uh, ten divisions horizontal. So you know for you square graticule aficionados, I don't know. Maybe you can square it up. Maybe there's an option there to get more horizontal in there. I mean, you do have your 400 meg of memory to play with. Just in case you wanted to know, can't hear this thing at all. Jeez, you put your ear up to it and you can just hear it, but no, I, that, that big fan's doing its business.
See what the function gen goes up to? 100 meg! <laughs> Bobby Dazzler! 100, wow, is that the fastest built-in function gen on a scope? Damn well could be. So what, are, what types have we got? <laughs> Cardiac pulse <laughs> right there, just, you know, right on the top menu there. Is that, no, no, yeah, yeah, there's more, there's more, oh, no, and ARB, of course, what kind of modulation? Got AM, FM, FFS, FSK, no, nah, that's it. Sine square ramp for the modulation, and of course you get your depth and your frequency. And the second SIG gen, is that also capable of 100 meg? Yep. And can we do like the draggy drop thing? So let's go into, say, the SIG gen menu. Can we just like take that and, yes, yes, yes we can. Look at that. Does it dock over here? It doesn't dock, but you can actually move it around. Does it stay there if we shut it down? No, no, it goes back to there. I don't know if that's... I don't know if you want that or not. Um, maybe. Anyway, we'll go check out measurements. So you notice that I haven't uh, used any of the buttons yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I should have moved that. It's well, a little bit laggy in its response. But yeah, we can, we can push that, go back to center, push that for... Yep, horizontal, we can move that around, push to go back, horizontal, fine vernier, no worries, level, yep, we can set for, what, did that just uh, fail to trigger event on trigger source one? Oh, I like that it pops up yellow, sort of like the warning messages pop up yellow, it's just sort of like nice and bright, you can see it, nice touch. Anyway, I will use the measure, statistics, see, here's where statistics are separate, I liked the Rigol I was playing with the other day, that it just automatically gave you the uh, stats. You didn't have to turn it on. Let's go uh, RMS, shall we? Do we have AC RMS? Th these are only basics. So basic vertical. Oh no, here we go. We've got more. There we go. AC RMS, standard deviation. I've done a whole video on that. And we'll get the peak to peak. I don't know why. Like, oh, there's that basic menu. And then you had to go into the, specifically in the vertical, if you wanted a bit more. Like vertical? I don't know what to think about that, but no, no, there's no more in there. Okay, so we can add that. So we can add multiple ones in one hit. Okay, and then can we just click outside there? Yep, we can. Aha, uh -huh, there they are, right down there. This is weird. PTP. That <laughs> took me a second to realize that's peak to peak. Um, no, just put PP, please. You know, or P dash P. Like, what's this PTP business? I don't like translation. Anyway, um, that is a standard deviation. So that's, uh, you know, if you don't know that symbol, it's kind of hard to see from here. It looks like an O, but it's not. It's actually the standard deviation symbol. So we don't actually have, yeah, so we don't automatically get any stats like that on. We can have to go into statistics and we have to actually turn statistics on. See, I think by default, like, you know, I think by default, just switch them on, although it takes up more real estate. Go on, because if, when, when you're using a scope and you want to measure stuff, you want to measure it, right? You, you don't want to dick around with a basic, just give me everything. Okay, let's say if you didn't want these here, could you dock them somewhere else? Can you dock them somewhere else? No, you can't. I, no, I expected to be able to maybe, or well, I was kind of hope, oh, hang on. Stats, can I drag, can I hold and drag? No, I can't hold and drag that. So it's not universally flexible. No, so you turn statistics off and it just, it vanishes there. So I would have, and why now do we, we've got the black space in there. That should have automatically dragged down, dragged down like that. Our vertical is five, it goes down to 500 microvolts. Check it out. It's got a one, two, four, and five. Sequence one, two, four, five. Why that's got to have something to do with the new 12 bit front end where it's optimizing the number of bits for dynamic range performance or something. I that's the first thing that came to mind, but I've, I've never seen a scope like some scopes do one, two, four sequence, some do one, two, five, but I've never seen a scope that does one, two, four, five. Yeah, I can only presume that they're maximizing the dynamic range performance of the 12 bit converter. That's that's got to be it. That's groovy. Apparently, it does have the full 1.5 gig bandwidth right down to 500 microvolts uh, per division. We we don't get the nice, you know, like graphical representation of the front end 
like you know with like the gain amplifiers and you know all sorts of stuff but anyway yes it does have internal uh, 50 ohm termination as you saw down there on um, the front panel less than 5 volts RMS yep so that's full bandwidth right so that's your noise 117 microvolts switch on the 20 megahertz bandwidth limit so we've got to go into bandwidth see i would have preferred like all of this stuff all i want like bandwidth you shouldn't have to go into a bandwidth menu like that i uh, you know look the user interface is, is it's pretty easy to use but i would have preferred that like just the grouping of stuff is i mean you'd, you'd get to, like see like you go into a different tab and you've just got this whole you know, this whole area just devoted just to bandwidth. Like, you know, why can't all that be on one screen when you call up the input, right? Because bandwidth is one of the things that you do all the time. Why can't just bandwidth be here? Put it to the industry standard 20. Oh, sorry, I didn't have my horizontal scale um, set. I usually do my noise on one, one millisecond per division. And I'll do one meg points. Bloody hell, I'm all over the shop here. So anyway, one millisecond per division, uh, one meg points with 20 megahertz bandwidth, 20 microvolts, there you go. So not quite as good as the Rigol one we looked at before, but you've got to understand, right? This is a much more serious bit of kit and the entire front end is designed for 1.5 gig bandwidth. So even though we're limiting it to 20 meg, you've got to realize that you've got to design the hardware in the front end, the amplifiers, to have 1.5 gig bandwidth. So they're going to be inherently slightly noisier. Uh, just the design of the front end amplifier ASIC for that is going to be inherently slightly noisier than one that you designed down to, I think the Rigol was half that, seven less than half that, 700 meg. But there's only like three microvolts difference in the noise there but uh yeah so you know in the slight penalty you're gonna uh pay there but still excellent we just want to have a look at the variable uh persistence mode here i've got a uh swept sine wave uh capture that you can see that that is a swept sine wave and we'll zoom in and we'll adjust the intensity there and there you go you can see that the lower frequency content is uh because it's being captured more is going to um, have a higher intensity and if we go over to the key side here you can see that that's doing uh, d exactly the same thing there slightly different intensity levels but doing essentially the same job so yeah the mxo has a really nice uh, intensity graded display really like it and of course you can go right up to 100 percent and <laughs> absolutely capture everything but yeah it's really neat all right let's compare it to the keysight 3000 which is pretty much the fastest updating uh, scope on the market and you can really get a sense of the size difference here um <laughs> this is a really really big scope look at that i mean this is already a decent sized scope but this is just enormous, so that screen is enormous. Anyway, the huge banner spec on this is like the industry's fastest updating scope at four and a half million waveform updates per second. And apparently the best you can get is five million waveform updates per second. That's like the theoretical maximum. We might go through some uh, calculations later. Anyway, I'm generating a rump pulse here, which appears basically once every one million waveforms. So you can see that you can see it just jumping up here. I've turned the intensity right up to maximum. And when you're finding, uh, you know, glitches and runt pulses like this, uh, you know, infrequent uh, stuff, you've got, you know, it helps to turn the intensity right up to 100%. But you can see it's, it's at least capturing that, you know, a couple of times per second is doing really well. Exactly the same waveform on the uh, Keysight scope over here. And you can see, yeah, it pops up every second area sometimes twice a second so at 100 nanoseconds per division on both um yeah the it does seem to be faster than the benchmark key site but of course the update rate is uh dependent upon the time base and the memory depth and as we'll see other stuff you've got turned on now when i first did this in fact i uploaded this on my uh second channel and i wondered what the heck's going on it was so slow it was dog slow it was less than a thousand waveform updates uh per second and i'll show you why in a minute but if we go into acquisition up here, you can see that uh, the I'm in auto memory depth uh, mode here, um, which you can see at the top there, it's actually for, it's selected 4K points. But if we actually set that to manual, and apparently their 4.5 million is rated on 1K points of memory. So that's the lowest. So you can see it's, it looks like it is quicker 
now but really you don't run a scope in pretty much any scope you want to use it most of the time in auto memory uh, depth mode and that's what the key side is really good at so we'll put it at its absolute fastest okay I don't know if this time base 100 nanoseconds per division is fastest we can test that in a minute but 1k record length and it's got this cool speed mode down here which tells you check it out it actually tells you the waveform updates are per second. It's it's actually under a meg here. It's doing 880k uh, waveforms per second. Uh, average blind time is 120 nanoseconds. And the percentage of the time captured, which is basically uh, less the dead time, so it's 100% less uh, the dead time that you're wasting is 88%. And if we change the horizontal here, you'll notice, there we go. It's absolute, it's now 100%, okay? And we're getting 3.3 <laughs> megs per second. But you'll notice our waveform is now not no longer full screen because we're at in a manual 1K point setting. So, okay, we've got 880K waveform updates per second. Absolutely fantastic. Seems to be faster than the key site. But watch what happens here. And this is the first time that I did it. And I was scratching my head and I had to contact Roden Schwartz and I felt like a complete dummy. Because what's, look what happens if I add a frequency measurement here. Watch this. Add. Boom. It is now just one simple measurement like frequency. It has the update rate. You can't see any runt pulse anymore of going to speed it's 1000 waveform updates per second i thought oh just simply turning on measurements was the cause of the problem here but no as it turns out it's only frequency but if we change that to something like peak to peak for example boom we're back <laughs> we are back and we're back at the you know 800k sample waveforms per second and i can actually add more measurements like that okay so i can add more vertical measurements like i can add rms and i can add uh, peak to peak and i can add uh, standard deviation so let's add all those measurements down here and boom we're still good at doing that but simply turning on the frequency that drops it from basically a million down to a thousand waveform updates per second. So Roden Schwartz said, um, yeah, that they plan to fix this in an update, but I haven't told him about the, it's the frequency yet. So that's interesting. And of course, uh, famously, if you do the same on the key site, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing, measurements, uh, cursors, whatever, um, it does not slow down the waveform uh, updating rate. So yeah, there you go. That's just an interesting quirk bug, I guess. Um, I hope that they can fix that and if i add curses uh for example that doesn't seem to slow it down either so yeah there's there's something with doing that frequency so let's actually go in and add another horizontal measurement shall we is it simply like a horizontal thing um like well can we actually add rise time can we do that does it is it going to kill it if we do rise time yep yep rise time seems to have killed it yep there you go, <laughs> 700 waveforms per second, not a million anymore, 700. So doing any sort of like horizontal measurement seems to kill it. Uh, I don't like that you can't just press twice to turn off curses. That's really annoying. But anyway, uh, we've got some vertical measurements there. We've got uh, cursors and it is still um, at its fastest update rate, which is faster than the key side at this uh, time base. What if we turn on spectrum analyzer? Oh, yeah, no, I, I saw one. It's, that's still pretty quick. It's slowed down a bit. Can I check the speed? Oh, okay, it's dropped down to 50k waveform updates per second. Exactly the same time base, same memory depth. It's now 4.18k points there. That's very interesting. Why did it change from 4 to 4.18? <laughs> I don't know. Um, anyway, yeah, there you go. We've got Spectrum Analyzer on. It's still doing 50k waveform updates per second. But of course, FFT is pretty power hungry. So, you know, you've got to expect uh, a uh, performance hit there. Okay, let's see what happens if we turn on peak mode here, which will give our uh, like frequency uh, peaks. So we're 47k per second, turn on peak, and well, yeah, it's really dropped. It's really dropped down to 60 waveform updates per second. That's doing some serious processing there. So the ASIC they've got in this thing, um, uh, yeah, it's it, it's not magic. It, it can't, like when you turn on extra processing functions, it will slow down the waveform update uh, rate drastically in some cases. But still, 
in, you know, a lot of general use, it's fast, it's way faster than the Keysight. But check this out, this is really interesting, even though we can't see the uh, Runt Pulse glitching up here on the clock, it looks like we can see it on the Spectrum. That is really quite remarkable, look at that. That's, that. oh, I just, just captured one up there. I mean, that's got to be due, oh, another one. There you go. That's got to be due to the run pulse. Yeah, there we go. We're currently running about 40,000 uh, per second because the FFT on this is ridiculously fast. I think it's 50,000 uh, FFTs per second, but it seems to be capturing the, well, well, the glitch seems to be upsetting it um, at a rate where it's it's visual like this. This might be an interesting test across uh, different scopes for FFT, but don't know if I've got time to set them all up and do that now, but wow, wow, we're actually seeing something, you know, if you saw this kind of glitching on your um, FFT response, you'd go, what's going on? Something weird going on there. So then you'd go into your waveform and you, even if you've got a slow update rating scope, you can set, you can turn on infinite uh, persistence mode and then you can, that's a way to capture uh, fast uh, glitches and run pulses like this without having a really uh, fast updating uh, waveform per second um, scope. So you'd eventually be able to uh, capture it, but you'd know something's going on there. Look at that. Wow. So that's the Roden Schwartz, and I've set up the exact same uh, frequency, center frequency and span on the uh, key side here. And um, no, we're not detecting that at all. That glitching you can see in there, that's actually the uh, channel uh, waveform. So that's, um, that's not the FFT, but yeah, we can't see the FFT capturing any glitches there at all. Whereas the, like, the Roden Schwartz just does it. Beautiful. But you'll notice that if we actually turn on peak here, which we saw before, it, it's automatically detecting our peak frequencies. But um, yeah, we're just not seeing, we're not capturing any glitches in there at all. It's not showing up on the FFT. So it, hence it's a slower update, um, a much slower update when it's uh, automatically detecting those peaks. But yeah, I mean, we turn that immediately back off and boom, shows up again. Wow. And if you want to actually show the values on there, just turn on peaks on waveforms. Look at that. I love that display. That is just a beautiful way to show that. Um, hats off. That That is fantastic. And of course, as you can see, the uh, resolution or number of points here is absolutely blowing away uh, the key site, which we uh, can't adjust. But we can actually adjust the span on here and the number of points. So what we've got here is uh, auto uh, RBW, which is the resolution uh, bandwidth, and then it displays it in uh, kilohertz like this, and we can adjust that. No, that's as low as she goes. At, of course, this is dependent upon the uh, particular um, span and uh, that you've got at the moment. If we go out, then it looks more like the key site, and there you go, 500 kilohertz, that looks pretty similar to the key site over here, but um, yeah, it's just, it, it's more better. Look at this bad boy. Um, and we're getting a greater uh, resolution on the vertical front end as well, because this is, we're only operating in 12-bit mode. In fact, if we turn on HD, what do we get? Ah, oh, nah, it's just more of the same. Turn HD off, no. Not a huge difference there. There's a little, no, nah, yeah, 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 dropped slightly i don't know i'd have to do like proper this is not the correct signal to like measure this with anyway but if you turn auto rbw on then you get uh, the span rbw which this is actually a ratio and it's currently set to a thousand uh which means that we have a thousand pixels across the uh, screen, well, across the capture uh, window here. So each point um, is, so you're going to get one point uh, per pixel, but we can actually do, and that actually goes up to 5,933. Don't know why that exact value has to do with uh, the sample rate and the uh, memory and the, the, the everything else uh, to do with the FFT processing, but we can go down like for a hundred uh, for example, then that means that each frequency in here is going to be uh, effectively 10 pixels across, and that's the equivalent there. 
to the key site perhaps but as you can see it's just much greater um, discrimination on the uh, signals here but you're getting the idea that's very impressive and uh, you don't have to call up uh, that menu uh, down here to actually uh, do that you can just go up there like that and use the ones up the uh, top menu and then adjust it like that but yeah um, suffice to say it's a really nice FFT capability but You'd want it at this price, and this is why it's one of their banner specs. Uh, just noticed a quirk. The front digits are cut off on the display there. Uh, why? Um, you know, you don't need this many digits right out to here. Um, and, and sacrificing the first one's more important, let me tell you. Right, so I'm going to do a shootout now between the current uh, king of the update rate, the uh, key site here, and uh, the, across different time base ranges in auto memory depth for most of them and see what we get. So, yeah, I'm getting the uh, trigger out of the uh, RNS at the moment and uh, going into here, then I'm getting the statistic and I'm getting the mean value uh, for the actual uh, trigger output frequency. So this is one nanosecond per division. There you have it. I spared you all the details. Uh, this is auto memory depth, which is, you know, what you're going to be using it most of the time. So no BS about, you know, setting it to 1K minimum or whatever. Okay, so, you know, apples to apples, uh, fair enough. And from one nanosecond to five microseconds uh, per division, of course, the uh, MX04 is capable of higher time base than that, but eh, it doesn't matter. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm um, flogging it. 2.3 uh, million waveform updates per second, uh, as opposed to 1.0 four so the key site does actually meet its million waveforms per second claim on uh, the four fastest time based settings but the mx04 does not meet the four and a half million waveform updates per second of course i was able to manually tweak it to do that uh, based on the smaller memory depth in fact i think i got six at one point on one particular circumstance so it is capable of the claim but in auto memory depth which most people are going to use it at nah there's a bit of marketing wankery uh, going on in there but still it's flogging the guts out of the uh, key side here and then it jumps up to 3.3 here at 20 nanoseconds per division so that's over three times well over three times better um, and uh, then it drops back to 1.66 meg and 900k and that's only 300k 476 and 196.67 even at the slower time base settings you know this is like once again it's three times uh faster here so yeah anywhere from two to three times um faster which is a pretty decent improvement so all hail the new king of waveform update rates the mx04 series from roden schwartz we're not worthy we're not worthy we're not worthy and a brief play around with the logic analyzer on this thing because uh, it uses these uh, nice HDMI interfaces here. I really love this cable here. It really feels super quality, but it probably want to uh, for the price. Anyway, um, this is an eight channel uh, module. So I've got uh, two of these. I really like how the uh, channels plug into there it's brilliant and i'll show you some of the uh, probe uh, capabilities in the software anyway i'm just generating a uh, bus here a 25 meg bus and there you go we're actually uh, measuring a uh, we're measuring an analog channel there and i've set up actually two different buses plus a bus decode down here and you can actually set up um, inside the logic analyzer you can actually set up four different uh buses uh so to speak in here so i've only set up two but that's really cool so i can actually tap on that and adjust the position of that entire bus independently of this bus up here for example and then we can move the uh, bus decode there so we can zoom in on that and and see the higher frequency stuff here i'm actually triggering on the analog uh, waveform at the moment but i can trigger on any of the uh, digital jobbies you can actually see the jitter in the signal in there you can actually see <laughs> this is uh basically even if i trigger off the digital which i can do go up to trigger and then channel source d0 for example oh, no i can't because then all the others are going to be upset so d7 there for example so i'm now triggering off uh, d7 can see the slight jittery sampling area that's not due to the scope that's hello uh, uh, it's locked up all right one cool thing i'm doing right now is i'm doing a remote firmware update via the ethernet 
which is fantastic if you've got this thing in a remote location and you need to, um, you know, uh, update the firmware like I do because it's been locking up on me. So they gave me some new firmware, 1.2.32. Uh, so it should do it without any intervention whatsoever. That's the plan anyway. I'm going to see if it uh, comes up with uh, my original boot screen with all my digital um, stuff on it that I had or whether or not it, you know, it nukes the settings because I didn't save them before I started the firmware update. But anyway, we'll see. Very cool feature. And there it is. Yep, it did. It, it came up with my, uh, the logic channels and everything that I had set up. So am I good to... Am I good to go? Yep, I'm good to go exactly where I left off. <laughs> oh, wow. That's fantastic. Thumbs up. And check out this feature here. I really like this. You see that uh, all the buses are close together. So if you actually click on those, you know, I wasn't sure which one I wanted to select. So it pops up with this. Um, so, you know, yeah, I want to select D6. Thank you very much. And then uh, you can move D6 and you can do whatever. But yeah, it's it's really very nice. And then we can do things like, uh, you know, select uh, this bus here, uh, the uh, decoded bus and then we can actually um you know expand the size of that decoded bus there so that's that's really quite neat but yeah we can group and move uh entire buses like that which is really nice and then we can got the uh decode uh, table down here and unfortunately though i have had it lock up on this um and they haven't uh fixed it yet i did upgrade the firmware there's if you want to see details on that uh there's exclusive videos over on my uh odyssey channel but um yeah apart from the lockups that i've had um it's <laughs> it's functionality is great we can trigger off channel one which is the analog channel and then yeah you can see that just did, 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 did. Uh, yeah we've got system jitter in there um this has supposedly i'm not going to test it but uh it supposedly has like the industry's lowest uh trigger jitter at like one picosecond or something it's insane i'd have to think about how i could actually test that if i even could do that here Okay, just trying out the uh, serial decoding here. I've got a uh, UART uh, 9600 board here, and it's, uh, as you can see, it's doing EEV blog, but I've actually got it triggering. If you go into trigger here, I've actually got it set to uh, the source is the serial bus. So I'm not triggering off the digital data, I'm actually triggering off the uh, serial bus itself. I'm going to set details. I'm actually triggering off uh, the receive signal equals to uh, pattern 45, which if I go in there and ASCII, that's actually capital E, if you can see that. Sorry about, uh, you know, if you're not viewing this in HD. Continue now to continually trigger off. It doesn't start here because you remember our trigger points are actually in the middle of the screen. Can we get rid of that? Trigger points in the middle of the screen. That's why our E is here like this, but this is continuously triggering. So I can single shot capture that, boom, and it's going to appear in the middle. So like that. And then of course we can use the cool history mode. We're only capturing one history like this at the moment, um, but we can actually go in there and set our end single count like that. Let's say we wanted to capture, I don't know, 50, boom, three, four. So it's actually counting up. So 50 is actually too much at this uh, waveform update. Uh, speed actually so let's set that to five and let's do that again and you'll notice that it's going through history two three four five unfortunately the update rate is quite slow here but we are one millisecond uh, per division as well and we're 8.3 uh, meg points and stuff like that but now we actually have the history in there and we can go in there and we can actually replay that, although our data's not changing. Sorry about that, it's not actually uh, changing, but we can go in there and we can actually replay our data. So if it was actually changing, we could actually capture, um, you know, some sort of a glitch in the data or something like that. Well, actually, I can actually show you that by simply not triggering off my uh, bus anymore. So let's trigger off D1. Now we'll find that EEV blog is like all over the shop like that. So now we can go single shot capture like that. And it's going to capture all these different, you know, out of sync uh, data, well, out of trigger sync data, so to speak. And boom, bingo, we've got our history. And we can go in there and we can actually uh, replay our different frames. So as you can see, our different frames are changing in there. Neat, huh? So I've just changed the uh, memory uh, depth now to 100k uh, points like this. And as you can see, 
it's much faster updating now. So that was just a uh, basis of the sample rate and the uh, memory depth as well. Now, I'm doing this at 9600 board, but I was not able to get, I was able to decode it fine at one meg uh, bits per second data rate, but I couldn't trigger off an individual data packet at one meg. Let's see if it now works at one meg uh, bits per second if I have the lower uh, record length limit here. Data rate is now one meg, and you can see I, I like how it turns red like that. So to show you that the time base needs to be expanded. All right, there we go. And oh, we're getting no deca Oh, we haven't matched it, duh. And I've got to go into bus here, and we can go in there, and that's one meg bits per second. Boom, there you go, EV blog. We are decoding on that. But now, can I do the trigger thing? And can I have my source as the serial bus one? Is it gonna, no, no, it's not doing it. So I'm not sure where the limitation, the processing limitation exists for doing a data packet trigger, but it doesn't seem, it works fine at 9600 board, doesn't work at one uh, meg. I don't know, you'd have to do a lot more experimentation to try and find something like that out. Okay, let's test the uh, HD mode here. I've got a uh, cardiac pulse. I've got it set to one volt per division. As you can see up here, we're uh, 12 bit uh, resolution because HD uh, mode is off. So if I just single shot uh, capture that like this, and then we zoom in, eh, you know, it's a bit fuzzy wuzzy, right? So let's take that at 50 millivolts per division, okay? You can barely see anything else in here like this, okay? So we'll go back to one volt per division capture. We'll turn on HD mode. Now, the HD mode here, it'll give us a bandwidth and we can adjust the bandwidth. And you can see that at 500 meg bandwidth, it's set to 14 bits. But if I go in there, I can actually tweak that. Like, well, I drop it and then if you drop down to 200 meg, it goes to 15 bits, then 100 meg, 16 bits, 50, can we get higher? You betcha we can at 10 megahertz bandwidth, uh, which is still fine for this uh, cardiac pulse, then you can see that we're getting effectively 18 bit resolution on this thing, okay? So let's get out of there. Let's single shot capture that exact same thing again. You can see it's finer. Hopefully you can see it's finer on the screen, but let's actually now go in there and go down to our 50 millivolts per division and now you can see wow look it really brings out that pulse in there i can actually adjust the intensity there so you can there you go that's that's much better there you go you can really see that you know there's a little pulse in there i'm not familiar with my cardiac waveforms but all you medical people can tell us what that little um uh, pulse there is and of course if we go to if we single shot capture that you can see that's a legitimate uh pulse in there and then we could uh, of course, go further into that to have a look at that. So there you go. That's 18-bit resolution. Very schmick. Now, if we compare that to the uh, Rigol HDO 4000 series here, which is also a uh, true 12-bit uh, scope, we can put it in uh, high-res mode here. And once again, bandwidth equals 50 megahertz. Uh, and we can, we've only got 14 or 16-bit. So we can't get that 18-bit resolution like we can on the uh, MXO4. But anyway, let's let's give it a go, shall we? There you go, let's single shot capture that. Once again, one volt uh, per division. Let's uh, zoom into that. And 50 millivolts are uh, zoomed in. Yeah, you know, it's it's not as good as the MXO4. The MXO4 just allows us to set an extra level of uh, sampling resolution on there to actually give us um, effectively greater resolution up to 18 bits there at a lower bandwidth. If we go into the quiet menu there, you can see that it doesn't give us any extra like bandwidth uh, resolution uh, adjustment in there so that we can extract those greater bits out but the MXO4 can so yeah it's really neat and did I mention that you can set uh, individual bandwidths on uh, all four channels but you can see if we go in here at the moment uh, they're currently set to 10 megahertz down here because this is the effective bandwidth even though our bandwidth is uh, currently set I'm just doing channel 3 here um, it's bandwidth is set to 700 megahertz meg our effective bandwidth is 10 meg because we've still got 
that HD mode active. So if I turn off the HD mode, bingo, there we've got our 700 meg. So now we can have, I've got 700 meg here on channel two, I've got uh, 20 meg. So I can set individual bandwidths there for uh, these, like, you know, you've got your traditional fixed ones, but then you can set a probe bandwidth in here and you can go into, you know, you've got all the Roden Schwartz art probes, of course, but you can actually go into user defined like this and then you can actually go in there and you can actually set the probe bandwidth like this to anything you want. Let's say you wanted like, a, I don't know, 850 kilohertz bandwidth on channel four. Bingo, you've got it. It's brilliant. Now it's a bit convoluted how you go in and get this, but you have to actually go into settings over here and then you've got to go into appearance like this and then you've got to use color table like that and you can, you know, a single event and then you can do like spectrum type color, like, you know, really temperature. I'm not sure what this single event type mode here is, but it's kind of like, you know, they're adding the dots in there. It's kind of cool though, but there you go. We can get a color graded display. Of course, this is not the uh, best thing to show this off. Let me try something else. We can get a sine wave and we can add some funky looking noise. And there you go. There's your more uh, traditional uh, temperature color display. Blue, of course, is like re represents cold because there's less of the uh, less time that the uh, signal has spent there. Most of the time is going to be red. It's the hottest because it's uh, there's the most number of waveform updates at that particular uh, point. You might be familiar with that uh, display on, uh, you know, some old school uh, tech ones, uh, for example. Were they the first to introduce that sort of display? I'm not sure. Leave it in the comments down below. But yeah, anyway, and of course, if you single shot capture that, you'll see it's actually, it's more random. So it's not quite as red in there but over time uh, most of the energy of your signal will of course be in the middle with you know just some really small outliers out there so you know it's there's a really nice flexibility in here and I don't think adding that actually dropped the waveform update uh, speed here. Anyway, it's got huge flexibility in terms of uh, channel bandwidth and uh, displays and filtering and high definition mode up to 18 bits. And it's all uh, ridiculously impressive. And you might be wondering, can we get that color spectrum on the uh, FFT as well? Yes, well, I believe so. Once again, setting, if we go into colors over here and you choose your channel source like this, I mean, what scope allows you to select the channel source? right we can go down here spectrum one average color table on there we go so we can actually have different color tables didn't work there at first because i was using the average so you can have spectrum one average spectrum one max spectrum one minimum and spectrum one normal like it's just it's nuts anyway we can turn that into a square Look at that, that's just absolutely gorgeous. And of course we can uh, turn on the uh, peaks as well there. We can get rid of our table here. It's probably, I, I think it's probably easier to use with a mouse because it's, you know, it, it is a bit fiddly sometimes to, uh, you know, expand windows and stuff like that. And of course we can uh, dock things like this. Say we wanted uh, channel one like this. We can go, we want channel one on that half. Thank you very much. We want channel two, whoop. We can like have them docked like that. So that's all channel one. That's channel two. Channel three, where can we add that? We can add it down there like that. And that's already set up as channel four. And you can like change the arrangements and stuff like that. So obviously if we move, yeah, there we go. We can move our channel four. We can move our channel three and channel one like that and you can do that uh, like there's various configurations with different modes and stuff so you know it's, it's really quite flexible how you can uh, dock stuff like that really like it right so i can just start going uh, crazy with this windows like i can turn on the uh, spectrum analyzer here and so i've got spectrum analyzer got channel one channel two i've got eight uh, digital channels down here and you could have multiple buses you could have serial decodes I've got three and four over here like this and I can just you know configure them any way I like because uh, often you just want like you know a small waveform over here you just want to make sure something's active and you don't want it like taking up all the space you're using the rest of the screen to like analyze your main signal and you don't want stuff to get in the way you just want to but yeah but you don't want to like hide uh one of the channels you just want it there monitoring so you know with this huge screen you can make use of you know like just this screen alone is you know as big or bigger than you know your traditional uh, bench scope so but now you can you know have a couple of other monitoring windows over here and it's just it's wonderful 
and check it out. I just took it out of the box. This is the new uh, Siglent SDS uh, 2354X HD. So this is the 12-bit uh, jobby. Thank you for Siglent for sending it in. I've got to do videos on this one. Uh, it's only 350 meg bandwidth as opposed to the Roden Schwartz 1.5 gig. Right, we're not even talking in the same class, but it is a 12-bit scope and it is low noise. So I just want to uh, check the noise performance. So I've got one millisecond per division. I've got fixed depth uh, memory mode uh, 2 meg, 500 microvolts uh, per division. I've got the same on both. And uh, standard deviation, we're getting 64 microvolts RMS, uh, standard deviation noise there 50 ohm are uh, terminated full bandwidth and if we compare that to the rms there we're talking 117 microvolts but of course the reason is this is a full 1.5 gig bandwidth so uh and this is one meg of memory uh the signal you can't set one meg you can only set two meg so you know but yeah, it's basically equivalent and that's a bit higher than the spec which is supposed to be 98 microvolts so not quite sure what's going on there dolt silly me uh, uh Roden schwartz only specify up to one gig bandwidth but this is actually one and a half so if i lower it to one gig uh we're only getting 91 microvolts now so the spec is 98 so yeah well within but if we adjust the bandwidth down to match the Siglent 350 meg uh, bandwidth, then yeah, it's lower. Yeah, 54 microvolts. Uh, this is AC RMS. I've done a whole video on that. Won't go into the uh, details. Um, and so it removes any uh, DC uh, component. And uh, the Siglent is uh, 64. So yeah, the Roden Schwartz is just under um, the Siglent for an equivalent bandwidth, 50 ohm input, yada, yada, yada. But Roden Schwartz actually specified the uh, noise over uh, different bandwidths. Uh, so I'll put that up here. So, you know, it, it's much more comprehensive. But you, know, you could go one scope's lower noise than the other in this circumstance and that circumstance. Meh, whatever. It's really low noise scope. True 500 microvolts uh, per division front end. None of that uh, software amplification rubbish. Anyway, this video has already been crazy long, so I'll call it uh, quits there. And uh, like, I haven't even touched on other banner features that they've got in here. You know, main banner features like uh, one one thousandth of a division uh, digital triggering, which is, I think, industry uh, best or something like that. And uh, also it's got, uh, I believe, a dual uh, zone, dual time base zone serial decoding. And uh, like, you know, tons of other stuff, which I... Like, you could spend a month playing with this and find new cool stuff that it does. I haven't even scratched the surface. Anyway, thank you very much, Roden Schwartz, for sending this bit of kit in. It's absolutely amazing. It's going to be awesome here in the lab. I'm going to be able to do lots of um, amazing stuff. And if you want me to do a uh, video looking at a specific feature of uh, this scope, then... So if you want me to do a specific video looking at any specific uh, feature more in depth, then I can do that on uh, the second channel, the EV Blog 2 channel. Got over 100,000 subscribers. It's where I put ton of content. If you're not subscribed to EV Blog 2, what are you doing? This goes to show you what an advanced scope like this can do it's absolutely incredible yeah it's got some downsides some of the interfaces i go like sometimes as i said like hit and miss interface sometimes i go oh that's brilliant other times i go oh that's annoying you know and stuff like that and of course i've uh, done other videos with remote operation uh of this thing and also uh, using the frequency response analyzer um and i'll have to link all these videos in but it's just like it's unbelievable and of course yeah if you have to ask the price you can't afford it it starts at like eight thousand yankee bucks and goes up there you know it goes upwards depending on uh the features but 1.5 gig um analog bandwidth 12 bit uh true front end right down to 500 microvolts uh, per division and the insanely good FFT on this thing, it's just so fast. But you expect that from Roden Schwartz, who are one of the, you know, leading uh, spectrum analyzer uh, companies, you know, RF companies. That's what their traditional market is. So FFT in this is just streets ahead of, you know, most other uh, scopes. It's just, uh, it's chalk and cheese, really. Um, and it feels like a real spectrum analyzer as opposed to, uh, it's, you know, uh, FFT mode. Yeah, it kind of sort of works on my scope. But, you know, this one feels like a real spectrum analyzer. It's absolutely fantastic. Four and a half million waveform updates per second is just, ah, uh, come on. This, this thing is just nuts. Uh, yeah, Roden Schwartz have a uh, really incredible scope here. And this is like just uh, like a mid range scope for them. 
they do like much higher end uh, ones if you're, you know, if you're really serious. But yeah, this is a very impressive bit of kit. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, leave your thoughts and comments down below. And as always, you can discuss over on the EV blog forum. Catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.